good. Let's all stand 786. Count your blessings on the screen. When upon life's billows you are tempted, tossed. When you are the search for all is lost. Count your many blessings, name it one by one. And you will be found what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name it one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name it one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Are you ever burdened with the Lord? Before we take our seats, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and thank God for his many blessings on our lives. Brother Sam, why don't you lead us in prayer? Father, thank you for this opportunity, this privilege to be here, Father, tonight in, in your house for this new big prayer service. And Father, uh, that song we will be thinking, Father, because many times we don't count our blessings. I pray, Father, that uh, we'll be more appreciative of what you've done for us yes. and what you're doing for us. Even uh, right now, um, I pray, Father, that you be with us tonight. I pray, Father, that you with uh, Brother Travis as he proclaims your word, that we attend your word. Father, those that are, are hurting right now, we think of the Reese family, uh, the Stanley family, others, Father, that, that passed and families are hurting. I pray about you. You teach us that your grace is sufficient and it sounds like these that that those families need your grace. I pray that you keep going with the Father. Lord, forgive me, my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good to see you tonight. Take your Bibles and open to the book of Colossians. I'm glad that you're here uh, for our midweek Bible study and, and time together in prayer. Uh, we'll share some prayer requests at the end uh, of the service, a few that I, I'm aware of and maybe some that, uh, that you'd like to, uh, to share. And then we'll have time of prayer together before we're dismissed tonight. Uh, but we're walking through the, the New Testament. We're going book by book through the New Testament, kind of getting a big picture of what the, uh, the entire story of the New Testament. And we've come in our study uh, to the book of Colossians. If you haven't grabbed a handout, go ahead and grab one. Uh, right now, if you'd like to, uh, they're back there. I sure do appreciate little Emma uh, Owens. She's been folding those for me and doing a fantastic job of that. Uh, she usually does it on Sunday nights, but she came in early to get this one uh, done uh, tonight, uh, and that's a, great, uh, that's a great blessing to me. Yeah, but I, I like to summarize each of these books with a word, kind of like a sermon in a sentence. Uh, it, it takes me longer than a sentence to get the sermon preached, but uh, the sermon in a sentence uh, for the book of Colossians is uh, Jesus is supreme, the supremacy of Jesus. That's what this book teaches us. He is supreme over all things. And you'll see that when we get to 
If you look at the very back of that handout and you see a suggested outline of Colossians, really basic for the four chapters, just three main headings, and you can see there the, the different ways we talk about Christ being supreme. And we'll, we'll look at that in a little more in depth here in just a moment. But let's talk about the city of Colossae. As I like to say, the, this letter to the Colossians, the New Testament, when we read the New Testament, we're reading somebody else's mail. And this is a letter to, in this case, a church, a church that was located in the city of Colossae. Colossae was a city in the Roman province of Asia. Asia was in the western, the, the Roman province of Asia was in the western portion of what we call Turkey today. And we've been in that, this part of the Roman Empire when we walk through Ephesus and some of those areas, we have been in that part of the Roman Empire. And so it's western Turkey, what we know today. It was a small town that was uh, primarily located in the Lycus River Valley. It formed a tri-city area with Laodicea and a town called Hierapolis, which are mentioned at the end of the Colossian letter. And this Colossian letter is what I like to refer to as a cyclical letter. So it was written first and foremost to the church at Colossae, but it was also intended, we know this from the end of the letter, to be rotated between those churches in Laodicea and uh, Hierapolis. Uh, Ephesus was most likely a circular letter, and Galatians definitely uh, was one of those. Written that, and, and originally went to, in the case of Ephesus, that church there, but rotated around uh, the, the, that um, area. It's probably most likely the seven churches in, in Asia, the, the, the letter uh, of the Ephesians. And then Galatia was written to specific churches in the southern province of Galatia, the, the southern part of the province of Galatia. Here's what's interesting when it comes to Colossians. Different from Ephesus, different from the churches in Galatia, uh, Paul most likely never visited this city. This was a, a, city, a church that would have been planted most likely out of his ministry to Ephesus. Now he, know, now, he would have known a lot of the people at the church in Colossae, and we will see that as we read through the, the letter. Uh, Philemon would have been an influential member of that church. His son, most likely Archippus, was the pastor of that church, and the church we know met in his home. And these were people that Paul obviously knew personally along with, with others. But he didn't plant the church in Colossae like he did at Philippi, like he did at Ephesus, like he did at Lystra and Derbe and Iconium and Antioch in Galatia. But this was the fruit of his ministry in the city of Ephesus. And Colossae was um, a small town, it is what historians tell us, but a very critical town because it was a place where east met, met west. And so there was, a, there was trade routes that went through this little uh, city, but also you have cultural influences from east and west coming together. A lot of exposure that many other towns would not have uh, enjoyed or experienced. And while it was a Gentile city, there seems to be a sizable Jewish population there. And what I want us to think about before we read any of uh, the passages from the book of Colossians, I talk about it being a place where East met West in a place where a bunch of different ideas and a bunch of different religions and a bunch of different worldviews collided, which wasn't very common in uh, small towns back in that day because they wouldn't have had the exposure that like an Ephesus or a Corinth would have where they were ideally situated large communities where great numbers of people from the, uh, all around the world and all around the empire would have migrated to, worked at, or, or went through as they were doing their business. But this was a smaller community, and while it did have a trade route going through it because of its location, this, meant this particular smaller community was exposed to a bunch of different views, a bunch of different religions, and a bunch of different ideas. You know, until the recent... Until the recent past, you know, your communities like ours, small towns, would have been uh, fairly isolated, isolated from a lot of different views and a lot of different religions and a lot of different uh, ways of thinking uh, because of uh, our, our rural nature. Uh, but those days are different. We, we, we don't live in a kind of uh, environment, not just here in Rockcastle County, but uh, rural, uh, rural America, rural Europe, rural wherever, 
We live in a society now where uh, we are exposed to everything going on in the world. And in our case, it's not because I-75 runs north and south through the heart of our county. Uh, it's not because of an influx of people moving in from other areas. And I-75 does run through the heart of our county. There, there, I'm sure there are people moving in from California or from the Northeast or places like that. But that's not what's exposing our community to all different kind of viewpoints, religions, and ideas uh, that are completely different from what's normal and traditional in our community. What is exposing us to all these different kind of ideas and religions is the Internet, Right? So it doesn't matter whether it's at home or whether it's a device that you have in your phone. We walk around with screens uh, that, where we can access uh, all kinds of information, all kinds of opinions, all kinds of uh, news that is either accurate or inaccurate or someplace in between. And we're exposed to it uh, on a regular basis. You are, your kids are, your grandkids are. Uh, it's, it's right there. And we need to recognize that, uh, that we, we live in a world that has shrunk. There's not a lot of dividing line anymore between uh, certain regions and the viewpoints of particular regions because we are exposed to things coming out of everywhere. And more than any other time, we need to be a people who are committed to this word of God and the supremacy of Christ that is, that is throughout the word of God so that we can rightly, di um, so that we can rightly discern our times and be able to communicate and answer the questions that are asked to us, not just based on some type of traditional answer, not just based on some type of regional answer about this is the way it's always been here. You know, that stuff doesn't fly because there's all kind of exposure to every other kind of way of thinking. And we need to be able to communicate, thus saith the Lord. And that's exactly why we, uh, why we uh, have preaching services three times a week. That's why we're walking through the New Testament in, in big chunks on Wednesday night. Well, I, I like to talk about who the author is and, and when it particular, probably would have been written and Paul is clearly the inspired author of this letter. He names himself like he always does right at the start of the letter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. He mentions himself in verse 13 of chapter 1 and at the end uh, of the letter in chapter 4, verse 18. Um, there is a close connection between this letter and Philemon. And as a matter of fact, it's going to be out of order, but our next study is not going to be from 1 Thessalonians, our next study is going to be from Philemon. Remember, the prison epistles are uh, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and, and Philemon. Those were letters written during Paul's first imprisonment. 2 Timothy was technically a prison epistle too, but it wasn't written during his first imprisonment. It was written during his second imprisonment when he was about to be executed. And Philemon and Colossians, uh, the reason I'm going to skip the order and do Philemon next is because Philemon is so closely connected to this uh, Colossian letter because the church at Colossae met uh, in his home. So when you read the, Philemon, the, the Colossian letter, and it take you about, uh, I read it this morning before I took dad to his appointment. Uh, I was sitting on his front porch drinking coffee by myself this morning, and I had my Bible open, and I read Colossians in about 12, 13 minutes. Uh, you can easily read it between 12 and 15 minutes. Philemon uh, is just Philemon is just one chapter. I, I forget how many verses off the top of my head, maybe about 20-some, and so it's, uh, it, it's a quick read as well. But when you read those two books, Colossians and Philemon, you'll see names like Onesimus. Onesimus, Onesimus factors in large in the letter to Philemon, and then Aristarchus and Archippus and Epaphras. These are all men who are mentioned in both letters, and it provides more of what's called internal evidence that Paul was the human writer. So if you, ever, if you ever read or if you hear me say internal evidence of who the human author of a book is, we know that God's word is inspired by God. All of the scripture from Genesis to Revelation has God as its ultimate author. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, for all scripture is uh, uh, divinely inspired, God breathed. But God breathed through human instruments. Holy men of God 
uh, uh, spake as they were moved by the Spirit, Peter says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. And so the human instrument, it's good for us if we're able to know who the human instrument was that God uh, inspired to write the, le uh, the letter, especially when we're talking about these New Testament letters. Uh, and internal evidence is evidence within the letter with specifically and then within the Bible in general that points to who the human author would be. And so Paul mentioning himself in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, that's internal evidence of his authorship. And another piece of internal evidence is all the crossover in names between uh, Colossians and Philemon. You'll see crossover names in other places. I mean, some of the people that are mentioned at the end of Colossians are, are, are mentioned elsewhere as well um, a, a few times. But uh, and Timothy is mentioned at the start of this letter, and of course he's all over the New Testament. But the, these specific names mentioned uh, quite a bit in both letters tie the two together. Uh, the apostle Paul was under house arrest in Rome when the letter was written. So if you look at chapter 4, verse 10, you, know, you, just, you don't just take my word for it when I tell you it's, it's referred to as a prison epistle. Uh, the reason I call it a prison epistle is not because somebody told me that, and somebody did tell me that. Uh, I was taught that, but I was, uh, I was taught it not just, that's what I say, so you better, you better believe it, but I was shown that from the Scriptures. So chapter 4, verse 10 He's, he's mentioning some folks, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. So uh, for a time there, Aristarchus is staying with him. Most likely not, as a, not a prisoner in the way that Paul was. Paul was a prisoner, and Aristarchus was staying with him and enduring that uh, with him uh, uh, just to minister to him. Uh, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salutes you. And Marcus, it's one of the things I love about this sister son to Barnabas. And we talked about these two when we went through the book of Acts and how Mark was John Mark. That's the gospel writer, John Mark. When he was on that first missionary journey that Barnabas and, and Paul led, and for whatever reason, Mark cut, he cut and run. He didn't, he, he didn't make it from start to finish in that, in that missionary journey. Whether it got too hot for him, whether he just got homesick, whether, whatever it was, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically what happened to make John cut off his participation in the trip. But here's what we do know. Paul didn't like it. Paul is the kind of guy, you start something and you finish it. It's a good, it's a good way to be. And Paul's the kind of guy who had high expectations for those people, first of all, who called themselves believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you say you're saved? Do you say you're a believer? Do you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ? By the way, those three terms I just used are all synonyms for the same thing. Believer, um, follower of Jesus Christ, saved. It's not different stages of saved people. There's not saved people and then believers and then followers, and you just kind of promote. No, if you're a saved person, you're, you're saved because you've put your faith in Christ, which is what belief means, and that means you are now a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, as you grow, as you get further away from that point where you've trusted Christ, your followership is going to become uh, deeper and it's going to mature, but it's all following Christ. And Paul had high expectations for people who said they were saved and who said they were followers of Christ. We should have those same high expectations, starting with ourselves, don't have high expectations for other people if you don't have it for yourself. That's kind of hypocritical. But we should have the, and, and when Mark, when it was time for the second trip, you know, Paul said, well, I ain't taking Marcus. And Barnabas says, we need to take Mark. And, and you remember, it caused a great division. And Barnabas took Mark, and he went, on, he went one way, and Paul and Silas went one way, and that's when Timothy came into the picture. They, re, they revisited the churches in Galatia, and they picked up Timothy, and they kept going, and they picked up others on, on, on the route. And I, I love rehearsing that because here was a great division. Here was Mark who cut and run. He didn't finish the job. Paul didn't appreciate that. So who was right? Was Paul right or was Barnabas right? And I think the answer is yes. Yes. Paul was right and Barnabas was right. Paul was right to have high expectations. 
Paul was right to say, you're a follower of Christ, you see it through all the way to the end. Barnabas was right to say, yeah, he fell, he failed, and he needs a second chance, right? Both were right. And what, what I love about this kind of text, and, and it's an easy throwaway text, it's easy to read chapter 4, verse 10, and not even pay attention to what's being listed there because we start to coast mentally, beginning in verse 9, he just, really actually kind of beginning in verse 7, he just starts stating names, none of whom we really know, and all of whom we have a hard time pronouncing, and it's easy for us to coast through that. But here we see in verse 10 that Marcus is someone who is still special to Paul, still Paul considers valuable, and guess what? Uh, um, if, Marcus, if Marcus comes to you, you make sure you receive him. This idea that there, there can be reconciliation between believers who have disagreements with each other. And that's an important lesson for us to understand. And this is kind of a freebie lesson, but it's important. We're in Colossians, and Mark has mentioned in Colossians a letter that Paul wrote, and we need to recognize that. There needs to be able to be, the world needs to see, fellow Christians need to see that when believers are at uh, 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 logger jam with each other, and, and, and they're crossways with each other for good reasons, not just for negative reasons, but if they're good reasons or negative reasons, there needs to be reconciliation between God's people. Do you believe that? And if there can't be reconciliation between God, God's people, how can we preach reconciliation to a lost world? Are you following me? And we need to recognize that. And, and I love it. I, I love when I read that. Aristarchus, is, you know, he's, he's hanging out with me. He's enduring my... My, uh, uh, my persecution here as a prisoner, and, and Marcus, sister, son of Bar uh, Barnabas, if he comes to you, receive him. Because Mark was there too. And if Mark comes to you, you, re you receive him as well. So that's how we know that Paul's a prisoner. And Philemon mentions that as well as the, uh, the account in Acts chapter 28. And so that means that this letter was most likely written in A.D. 62 because Paul was incarcerated in, in that time, A.D. 60 to, to about A.D. 62. So look at chapter 1 again, and look at verse uh, 8. This is kind of what, pre, uh, uh, this is part of the background of this letter. This is what precipitated Paul's um, writing to the church at Colossae. Well, look at verse 7, actually. Uh, As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So Epaphras had come from Colossae, visited Paul there in Rome while he was a prisoner, and not only to check on Paul, which he did, and not only to communicate their love uh, for Paul and their support of him, but most likely to report the details of false teaching that had begun to infiltrate that church in Colossae. And that, and that false teaching was coming from a variety of sources. Remember, it was a Gentile city, but it had a sizable Jewish population. And so there were, there were a variety of false ideas and theologies that were, taking, uh, that were trying to take root in this church from Jewish legalism. And if you look at chapter 2, you can see some of that. Uh, when, when you, uh, chapter 2 especially uh, outlines some of that. So, so verses 11 through 17, I'm not going to read uh, every bit of that, but we know it's Jewish legalism that's being talked about here, and circumcision is always the key because that was a big bugaboo for uh, some of the Jews in the first century because they had always been taught the importance of the covenant sign of being circumcised. And they had a hard time transitioning from that physical work to the idea of a spiritual circumcision of the heart by faith through grace. And so remember when we talked especially about the letter to the Galatians, they were really struggling with this idea that somebody could be saved, that a Gentile like me could be saved and be a child of God and be a part of the family of God and then be a part of the local church but not have a physical circumcision, a physical sign of some type of religious rite and ceremony. And so he says in chapter 2, verse 11, in whom, talking about Christ, by the way, who in him we are complete, verse 10 says. In other words, we are filled by him and we are filled in him, who, verse 9 says, 
and in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells. So he is everything. That's what the letter is about. But in him also, in Christ, you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins uh, of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And that, that kind of carries on all the way through verse 17. So you know he's, com he's combating Jewish legalism here. He's also fighting this, uh, the idea of mysticism. And that's what you see in verses 18 and 19. Mysticism, and, and look, there is great mystery when it comes to the faith. So, so let me compare this with you. First of all, look at chapter 1. You just probably have to just look down on the same page. Chapter 1, verse Let's look at verse 25, uh, 26. Chapter 1, verse 26. Uh, back it up to verse 25. Paul says in verse 25 of chapter 1, whereof I am made a minister, uh, about teaching about the gospel, according to the dispensation, according to the outworking of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, which has been hid from ages and from generations, so this mystery that Old Testament saints, some of whom prophesied about the, the New Testament era and uh, the, the Messiah and his crucifixion and his resurrection and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the engrafting of Gentiles into the work of God in this way, that they prophesied about it, uh, but they didn't understand it because it was, it, it was something that was uh, not for them and not something that they saw fulfilled. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And here's that mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so don't miss the mystery. This idea that we can be redeemed by the creator and the sustainer of the universe. That's how he's described earlier in chapter 1. And that this, the creator and the sustainer of the universe, the one who made us in his image, and we were made to glorify him forever because he is preeminent. All that is stated in early in chapter 1. But we, uh, but we fell. We fell in sin. And Adam and Eve's rebellion has been, since that point, inherited by every one of their descendants. That's every, every one of us, all of mankind. And because of our sin nature, we are separated from God. And the only way that we can have reconciliation with this God is for God to put on flesh and to die in our place as the God-man. And having died in our place, we would be complete in him if you would put your faith and trust in him alone, and it would be a great mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, we can understand that. We can preach that, which I've declared, but it's, it's something that is beyond our comprehension to totally understand the love of God and his working out what he proclaims here. We can, we can believe and we can understand what he's written and we can proclaim and live accordingly, but we can't plumb the depths of what it means for Christ to love us and for Christ to redeem us and for Christ to dwell in us. So your body, believer, is the tabernacle, the tent of the Holy Spirit. That's pretty awesome, amen? Amen. It's also a great mystery. Now that's different from mysticism. So let me, now, now, now look with me. This is the false teaching of mysticism. Look at it in chapter 2, verses 18 and 19 in specific. Let no man beguile you, let no man confuse you, let no man lead you astray of your reward in a voluntary humility, worshiping your voluntary humility is, is abasing yourselves unnecessarily. Worshiping idols, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, talking about Christ, from which all the body by joints and bands have nourished, uh, ministered, and knit together, increasing with the increase of God. So beware, Th this is a kind of mysticism that doesn't communicate truth that's revealed, 
even hard truth that's revealed, even truth that is uh, on some levels mysterious. We can understand what's commu- with, we can understand what's been written, but we can't plumb the depths of it. But this is a, a mysticism that emphasizes and highlights experiences over what has been revealed. And so it's all about having an experience. It's all about having uh, uh, something that you don't come to understand and believe and hold, but something that you're waiting to happen to you uh, in in an unusual kind of, of, of mystical way. And, and I, think that's, I think that's really prevalent in, in our day, where people want to be and call themselves spiritual, but they don't want to be in this book. They, they, were, they refer to being in this book and living this and, and seeking to understand this, to live this out as dry and, um, and, and traditional or, or, or just all about words, but not all about action. And, and can people... Can't people just major on reading the Bible but never, not living the Bible? Sure, there, there can be people who do that. But I'm telling you this. If you come to this book with an honest heart and mind and you seek to read this book so that you can live this book, if you come to this with an open mind and an open heart and a desire to magnify Christ, your life will be changed by reading and applying this book. Do you believe that? But if you just come, if you just come to it with a... Uh, uh, a, a trivial pursuit, or if you come to it half-heartedly, you're not really in it, you're just opening up and kind of looking at letters on a page and then moving on, yeah, it's, it's not going to have any kind of impact on you. But th- there, is a, there is a lot of mystical aspects to things that go by the name of Christianity today. And then there was, a, there was an emerging Greek philosophy called uh, Gnosticism. That had to do with intellectualism, uh, tr- uh, uh, Gnostic means t- uh, t- to know, and, and agnostic, you've heard of agnostic, so you put that prefix a, ah, before it means, you know, don't know. An atheist says there's no God, right? Theo, theistic is God, and atheist says there's no God. Um, here, here's one for you. Uh, uh, amusement, you know what amusement is? Muse means to think. Have you ever heard somebody say that, uh, have you, maybe a songwriter, you know, my wife is, is my muse. Maybe he's written a love song and my, my wife is my muse. Not my moose, but my muse. You know, she's, she's uh, so uh, my thinking about my wife, my knowledge of my wife has, has enabled me to write this, this love song. Well, amusement means what? No thinking. <laughs> That's what amusement is, is no thinking. And we, we, we live in an, area, in an era where amusement is a lot more prevalent than, than amusement. You know, we're constantly, we're amusing, if I can steal a, a title of a book from the 80s by a guy named Neil Postman, which I would recommend you read, we are amusing ourselves to death. And he wrote that. He was, a cultural, he was a cultural commentator in New York back in the 80s. It's a fantastic book, uh, and he, 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 he's all, he was prophetic. And he was talking about our love of screens when all you had was a TV screen, it, when you had a TV screen that you had to get up and turn off and turn on, or you had to get up and get your kids to turn off and turn on. Now every one of us walk around with a TV screen in our pocket. Why is the iPhone... Why are smartphones so popular? Is, is, are, is TV more popular or phones? And somebody says, well, smartphones are more popular. Well, the reason why smartphones are so popular is because we love our screens, right? We love our screens. We, we love to look. We love to watch. We love to monitor and be monitored. We do. That's why smartphones and social media are so popular. We can see what you're doing. I can see what you're doing. You can see what I, I'm doing. Uh, I can see what you've posted. I can see what she's posted. I can see what they're doing all the time. Look, I just saw it right here. It, it just happened in Mali, you know, and we love it. And we are we 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 excel at amusing ourselves to death. And a Gnostic is one who ha- who said they had special knowledge. They were all about knowledge. And they had a special knowledge, uh, 
And it might be connected to biblical truth, but it might not. And often it was not. And they, and they, they, so, they so deified the idea of knowledge that it didn't matter what you did physically because the body uh, can only do that which is sinful, but the mind and the spirit uh, and your knowledge uh, can, can be pure, and it doesn't matter what your body does. You, you see, there's, there's all kind of wrong things about that. That's why when you get to the, the part of the letter that has to do with the application of the theology, he says, and, and chapter 3 deals with all this over and over again, uh, about what we are to do physically if you have believed. And so this idea of intellectualism, this false teaching of intellectualism, this, and, and here's where somebody, if, if, if somebody who has a lot of letters behind their name, if somebody who's quote-unquote really studied it, somebody who's, uh, who's um, become kind of a critic and a cynic of the Scriptures, what I'm, what I'm saying right now, they will use as evidence to poke holes in, uh, in, in my own study, but also in what conservative scholars say about the scriptures, because here's what a critic will tell you. Gnosticism wasn't formalized and identified as Gnosticism until sometime in the second century, even late in the second century. But you're saying, Travis, that this letter was written in the mid-first century, A.D. 62 or thereabouts, and you're talking about uh, the Gnostic heresy. Well, well that's, why, that's why if you look in your notes, I am very specific when I say at the end of that first paragraph, this false teaching also was in the form of an emerging Greek philosophy which would become known as Gnosticism. It, while it might not have been formally identified yet as, as Gnostics, these people who held to this kind of uh, philosophy, it, 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 was, it, it started somewhere. It didn't just spring up out of nowhere, right? It didn't just spring up out of nowhere. And so this emerging philosophy, it, it already taken root in Greek culture, and it was starting to show its ugly head in Colossae in the mid to late first century when Paul wrote this letter. And that's why one of my favorite parts of Colossians is Colossians chapter 2, where he starts to deal with this idea of, philosophy, of um, Gnosticism, this, uh, this idea of, of intellectualism. So look at verse 8. Beware, be on the lookout, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. It's all about Christ. And here's one of the things the Gnostics had a hard time with. They had a hard time with the idea of God putting on flesh because the flesh can only sin but here we're saying that God put on flesh and lived a perfect sinless life and died for us so that our lives could follow after him in holiness now and ultimately be glorified in God's timing. But not after Christ, look at verse 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. What's that next word? Bodily. It's not just spiritual. It's not, just, it's not just some type of spiritual thing that we can talk about, but we can't see and we can't touch and we can't define. That's why, and you've heard me say in my small amount of time here, I'm not big on this idea of this is spiritual and this is secular. This is, this is the spiritual way and this is just kind of the other way. If God has saved you, everything about you is spiritual, is it just Spiritual in a positive sense or spiritual in a negative sense? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do. So, I, and I understand we use that, we, we use that term secular. I, I work my, it's my secular job or, or secular music. And I'm not a big fan of it. Because if you're a Christian, the job that you work is is the place where God is to be shown and God is to be revealed as you live for him and whatever that place is. And if the place where you work is the kind of place that no Christian should be a part of, you know, I don't know that you should be working as, uh, in a gentleman's club. I don't know that you should be working as a hitman for a crime organization or whatever place. You know, a, a Christian can't do those kind of things, right? So you, rem so you, you can't be... You can't be spiritual 
You can't be falling after Christ and doing that, so you remove yourself from that. But, but, but those kind of vocations are small. And the way that we do our jobs should reflect who our Christ is. Chapter 4 deals with that. And so whether you're packing the lunches or whether you're closing business deals or whether you're arresting uh, criminals or whether you're defending uh, criminals or, or, or prosecuting criminals or, or whatever, I mean, whatever, digging a ditch or uh, um, making cabinets, do all to the glory of Christ. Because verse 10 says, you are complete in him. And remember, you, you, that, that means you are, you are filled by him and you are completely filled in him. And he is the head over all principality and power. In other words, here's what that means. You lack no resource. And remember what he said to the Philippians? I can do all things through who? Through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians chapter 4, I'm going to forget that address. Philippians 4.13, is that what that is? Philippians 4.13 and Colossians 2.10 are parallel passages. They mean the same thing. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. You are complete in him. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So, that's the background of, uh, of this false teaching, no matter how it's packaged. And it's always packaged in, in different, in different it, it's the same kind of false teaching, which means it promises spiritual fullness, it's, it promises completeness, it promises perfection and wisdom just apart from Christ or in addition to Christ. And it goes by different names, but it's still the same stuff. It's just repackaged. It's like an old Christmas gift that you don't like, that you, uh, that you pull out of the box, that you received it, you put it in new paper, and you give it to somebody else. That's what false teaching is. It's the same stuff, just repackaged and, and presented again. And false teachers then and false teachers now claim, and I'm not talking about false teachers who, I'm not talking about people who obviously teach a different religion. I'm talking about false teachers who are in a local church. He's writing to a local church. And, and this isn't just be aware of what's going on in the church in the community of Colossae, but be aware of this stuff that's starting to seep in. You know, kind of like, peop, uh, kinda like the water damage, uh, when it just starts to seep in and bubble up in an area where water is getting into the house. Be careful of that. Be on the lookout for this, because false teachers will claim that they're not denying the Christian faith. They are claiming that they're only lifting the Christian faith up higher and illuminating secrets into a deeper life unlocking mysteries and revealing experiences that just reading from the Bible and trying to live it out can't show you. But that's false. That's false. And so, um, and by the way, this, the Gnostic heresy is not dead. If you've, if you've ever heard of Dan Brown, the author, in, in his books, and for the life of me, I can't think of the name of any of those books. I've read, I read one of them. Um, Tom Hanks star. Tom Hanks thinks his books are fantastic. Tom Hanks is a great actor, uh, you know, but he's not necessarily the role model that you need to follow. And he he thinks Dan Brown's onto something, and he's he's made a bunch of these movies that um, uh, based on the novels that Dan Brown wrote. If you've ever heard the History Channel or 60 Minutes or any of these other outlets, and they're really talking about the Gospel of Judas and those kind of things, those are all Gnostic gospels. And, 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 beloved, they're Gnostic heresies. Whatever label one desires to attach to false teaching, we need to avoid it. Now, uh, if you look at the bottom of that section, it says background. Like Galatians, Colossians is a polemical letter. That means it was written to combat error. We don't always like that. We don't always like that. You know, we... We, we, we want everything to be an inspiring um, rah-rah coaches kind of deal before we go out and take the field. And, and, uh, but sometimes we need to be told, hey, look, this is error. It's error if you're walking down this way. Here's why it's error. Don't walk that way. And unlike Galatians, in Galatians, if you remember that letter, I mean, the, the Galatian letter, just, it just smites your heart. He didn't have one good thing to say about those churches. Not one. Uh, but that's not the case in, in Colossians. Well, look at, uh, uh, look again at chapter 1, 
And we'll walk through this, we'll walk through the theme uh, before we close tonight. Uh, and we're, and we're, we're getting close to closing. But Paul, here's what I love. You, you, know, you know, the supremacy of Jesus is, is, the, is the sermon uh, in a sentence. But another way to have summarized this book would have been to say simply Jesus. Because the way Paul combats error is to simply point to Jesus over and over again. That's what he does over and over. And, and, and that starts off in the very first chapter. So in chapter 1, here's how he, he, combat, he combats this error by proclaiming the supremacy of Jesus in all things. So look with me in verse 15. Who? That, that interrogative pronoun is a reference to Jesus from the previous verse. Who? is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created. So we're not saying, and the Bible is not saying, that Jesus was created first. That's not what the firstborn of every creature means. I am the firstborn of Jimmy and Jan's son, or ch children, which means I was born first. I was born before Sarah, and I was born before Lacey. I'm the firstborn. But when the Bible is saying here that Jesus is the firstborn of every creature. He's not saying that he was the first created being and then came the others. Say, well, Travis, that's just convenient for you to say that. It's not just convenient. It's, it's biblical truth. Look at the very next verse. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So we, we, need, we understand the firstborn is not talking about just in order or in time, but in rank. He is before all things, and, okay, and by, all, and by him all things consist. He is eternal. And he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they are things in earth or things in heaven. And so therefore, verse 28, that's why we preach Jesus, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So you combat error by pointing to the supremacy of Jesus in all things. And then we go from there to our completeness. We don't lack anything. We are complete in him. So verse 3 of chapter 2, in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If, 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 he, if you are in his hand, if you have believed in him, and he has sealed you, he has indwelt you, and you have his book, then you have everything you need. You lack no spiritual resource. And I've already read verses 8 through 10, so I'm not going to read that again. But we are, Christ is, supreme, Christ is preeminent. We are complete in him. And, you, and my question is, do you believe that? Or, or, or when things go bad, when things go wrong, whether it's on a macro level in the, in the country or in the commonwealth uh, or, or on a micro level in your community, in your church, in your home, in your heart, when things go wrong, do you, do you have confidence in Christ? and that he will provide you the grace for the moment that you need, that he will provide the wisdom through his word and the leadership of his spirit that indwells you to be able to handle these issues and to stand up under the pressure and to glorify his name through it? Or, or do you throw up your hands and quit and say, I can't do it? And then, and then just melt or, 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 or use some type of earthly strategy to combat what you see as wrong. You either will believe that you're complete in Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures and fullness of the Godhead bodily, or you will not believe that, and you'll go down a different route. But he is supreme, and we are complete in him, and that means, therefore, that we need to walk in Christ. So chapter 1, verse 10 uh, points that out. Chapter 1, verse 23, continue in the faith. That's how you're proven that your faith is true to begin with. Continue in the faith, grounded and settled. Don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, uh, am made a minister. That, that same thing is repeated in chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. As ye therefore receive Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. I love it. 
Have you received Christ? Okay, then walk in him. You can't walk in him if you haven't received him. And then verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therewith with thanksgiving. And then chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, another of my favorite sections, talk about what it means to walk in Christ. You, know, you say, man, you're using preacher talk, walk in Christ. What's it mean to walk in Christ? And see, here's where people can get kind of mystical. And not always because they mean to, but because this is the only way they've been discipled. They don't know how to use any other kind of language. And they can kind of get mystical and they can kind of say, well, to me, walking in Christ is, or I think that walking in Christ is this kind of thing. Here's what it means to walk in Christ. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where are your affections set? Where are your affections set? Speaking of emotionalism and mysticism, have you ever heard of the Great Awakening? Has anybody here, show me a uh, uh, show of hands if you've heard of the Great Awakening. Great revival that swept through the colonies. One of those preachers was a guy named George Whitfield, an Anglican, by the way, from England. And um, I've read his, I've read a biography on him. I, uh, he's, a, he, he's an impressive preacher. Uh, but uh, that God used, I think, that man in a powerful way in, in the colonies. We, we, we weren't even a nation yet. And, and, and so much was happening that uh, one of the greatest American minds, period, but one of the greatest American theological minds, Jonathan Edwards, I mean, he was, he was a pastor. He was concerned about this. He was seeing these people get excited and stuff and, uh, and showing all kind of affections. And so he, he, was, he was concerned that it was uh, shallow and not the real deal. And what, and, and what he saw in his own congregation and as he, as he engaged with other people and as he talked with Whitfield is he saw a mighty work of the Holy Spirit in these colonies through the proclamation uh, of God's word. George Whitfield was not using smoke and lights and a rock band and, and, and all kind of smoke and mirrors and all kind of gimmicks. George Whitfield would preach for uh, hours on end from a hilltop. With no, with no um, amplification except for what God gave him. And he would just, he would cut it straight. And it was having a massive impact on these colonies. And as a result of all that, George, uh, Jonathan Edwards wrote um, uh, one of his um, uh, seminal works called Religious Affections. It, 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 it came out of that. And, and, and these, these right religious affections are having a desire and a passion for the things of Christ, as revealed in Scripture. And so Paul says, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Set your affection, verse 2, on things above, not on things of the earth. Because you're dead, and your life is hid in, uh, with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I, I'm still talking about what it means to walk in Christ. Verses one, and, and if you're saying, well, man, that, that's all highfalutin language, verses one through four, set your affections on things above, and I'm dead, and I'm, uh, I'm hid with Christ in God, and all that stuff. Okay, Paul gets even more specific. He gets, it, it, Paul says, you want to get low? Let's get low. You know what it means to get low, right? Paul says, let's get low. Put to death your members which are upon the earth. Put it to death. Put to death this wicked desires for fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. Uh, all of that is King James language for all kind of sexual sin that you can imagine. Heterosexual sin and homosexual sin. Put it to death. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience, in the which... Ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them, but now put off these things as well as anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy talk out of your mouth. Don't lie one to another. Put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man. And he goes on to talk about what that is in verse 12. Um, bowels of mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing and forgiving one another. Charity, verse 14. The peace of God ruling in your hearts, verse 15. 
being thankful, letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, admonishing one another and teaching one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what it means to walk in Christ. We don't get to define these things. We don't get to say who Jesus is. We have to see who Jesus is from Scripture. We don't get to say what it means to be spiritual. We don't, mean that, we don't get to define what it means. We had to read what it means and then follow after it by the grace of God in our hearts. He is preeminent, and that's a statement of fact. And all that, uh, all that is laid out there for us uh, in, in the theme of this book. Now, look with me. I've already read verses one, uh, chapters 1, verses 15 through 20, and that's the theme. I, there's other verses that might be able to be used. But I'm gonna, this, this wasn't in your notes, and I, pro- I should have put this in your notes, and I apologize. But this is just kind of this is just kind of to whet your appetite for it. You can look this up. There there are a lot of similarities between uh, Ephesians and Colossians. And remember, both these letters were written in prison. These were both prison epistles. And so there is a lot of overlap. It kind of encourages me as a preacher, myself as a pastor. It's okay to uh, repeat what you've already heard, what you already know. It's a good thing for us to be reminded of these things. We always have to be put in remembrance of those things. That's just a few examples. There are others, and I encourage you to take, uh, take advantage of, uh, of that uh, opportunity to look and see what uh, um, the similarities between the two books. But let me just give you an example from what I got up there. So Ephesians 1.16 says uh, that you know, we, we, we cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you, Um, uh, in my prayers. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, he he says the same thing. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, don't cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of the Spirit and and going on there. Uh, In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 1, he's talking about the walk we're going to have. Therefore, uh, I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, I beg you, I appeal to you that you walk worthy of your calling, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. That's, that's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, we hear that same idea repeated, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. See, the knowledge of God and walking worthy of our calling, living for God, those two things go together. It's not just this idea that you can have knowledge and, it, and you can be puffed up spiritually, but it have no impact on you physically in the way that you behave. I will say this. When it comes uh, to, these, to the similarities between these two books, Ephesians emphasizes the church as the body of Christ. We see that throughout the book of, uh, of, of, of Ephesians. And Colossians emphasizes Christ as the head of the church. And there's, there's your outline. Any questions you might have about Colossians, please um, you know, ask them as we're dismissed or maybe write them down. And uh, That's something we can do. I should have been mentioning that already. If you have questions about any of these things, write them down uh, and, and, and turn them in to me. You can put them in that prayer request box or hand them to me if you want. And um, it, when we have time, we'll, we'll try to deal with that uh, as, as we move through it. But Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the privilege of being able to open up your word and to study your word. And I know that these kind of sermons are a little different, and some people might even call it uh, classroom-like as we walk through uh, these books in a big-picture format, Uh, but that's okay. It's good for us to not just uh, pick and pull verses out of context in in these books to try to buttress uh, good ideas positive things uh, that we see, and it's very easy for us to do that. It's ripping verses or thoughts out of context, and we need to understand that the Bible is not an almanac. The Bible is not even an encyclopedia that just has random or even sequential entries, but it is a unified message. And as we study the big ideas of these books individually, We see the big idea of the book of the Bible, and it helps us to understand in smaller doses as we walk through texts in Sunday school and from the pulpit and in our own study. And as Colossians makes clear, what Colossians is clear about from chapter 1 through chapter 4 
is also, in large part, um, a, a major theme of the Bible, and that is the supremacy of Christ, the preeminence of Christ. And so, Father, may this be true in my life, and may it be true of Bible Baptist Church. May Jesus not just be prominent. Father, forgive us, forgive me, when Jesus is only prominent, because he is preeminent. And may that be the case for me, for our church, for all your people, so that we might see a great awakening in our own day and religious affections that aren't ginned up, that aren't phony, that aren't painted fire, but are down deep from our soul because we have been redeemed by the one who is preeminent, in whom we are complete, in whom is hid all the treasures of the knowledge and wisdom of God. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, here are some prayer requests I have, and this is a prayer request slash announcement.